That's right. Yes. Okay. So Gary Becker, nice to see you and welcome. Oh, thank you. Glad to be doing this. So Gary, um, I've got a friend named Steve Levitt who teaches at the University of Chicago. I believe you know him. A good friend of mine, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, Levitt and many others are quick to point out that you are the original rogue economist, uh, that you've <laughs> applied economic thinking to atypical topics like marriage and the family and discrimination and addiction for many, many years, and you began many years ago. Now, this wasn't necessarily a popular path at first, but you won people over. Uh, you also won a Nobel Prize, you won a U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom, and a lot of other awards. So. I just want to begin by asking you, I wonder, what's it like for you to see so much economic research these days that builds on the kind of work that you were doing, uh, that you began doing a few decades ago? Well, of course, it's very gratifying. As you indicated, there was a lot of opposition to this type of work when I and other people, I wasn't alone, uh, started uh, to do it. Um, people thought it wasn't economics. Um, it wasn't serious, as economists would call it, many of them call it in a disparaging way, sociology or whatever. It was not really economics. And so um, the, you know, the main centers, uh, aside from the University of Chicago and Columbia, where I, I taught for many years, if you look at Harvard and, and uh, MIT and Stanford, et cetera, uh, a, a overwhelmingly large fraction of, the, of their, these economists and others were, were very much opposed to it. So see the developments in economics, uh, to see so many young people uh, working on problems that in the past would have been considered way out, but not economics. You see the great success of Freakonomics uh, uh, with the, uh, you know, many very interesting applications of economic thinking to uh, you know, a variety of problems that I frankly hadn't thought about, but uh, been impressed by. See all that uh, is uh, clearly extremely gratifying and a feeling that, well, uh, you know, taking the heat in the beginning uh, was, was worth it. <laughs> Gary, you've, you've, um, you've been a force in the field of economics for, for a lot of years now, but um, also I don't want to um, paper over the fact that you're still very much an active uh, professor and researcher, still writing papers. Uh, one of the most interesting papers recently, to me at least, is your proposal uh, with the co-author for a market for human organs for transplantation. So let me just ask you briefly a, a two-part question about that. I, I'm very curious to know how you got interested in that topic, and then I'd like you to describe, if you would, um, your proposal for uh, and, and how a market for organs might work. Yeah. Well, let me f first say that the debate topic for high school students uh, this currently is whether there should be a market in organs. So people seem to begin at least to be taking it seriously enough. Um, I can't say I got into this because I had a close relative who, who needed a transplant. I mean, that would be a natural way to get into it, but fortunately I haven't had uh, anyone like that. I, would, I was just in contact with some surgeons who did transplants at the University of Chicago Hospital, and they were complaining about how difficult it is uh, to get organs. So they started thinking about it. Uh, I looked into the question a, a bit more, and, and so, well, it's obvious if you don't allow any price to be charged for it, um, and people getting organs don't have to pay for it, and people supplying them don't have to, don't get anything, you're going to have a shortage of organs. I mean, that's a natural implication of markets where you suppress price as uh, rationing the demand, uh, so it equals supply. So once I recognized that, then it was a, a short step to uh, say, well, let's introduce a, a market in organs, and it would be pretty simple. Um, in conceptually, at least, there'd be a lot of details, important details to be worked out. But what one would do would be look for a price that one would uh, pay an, an organ giver who had a healthy organs, so it would have to be healthy organs, and um, that uh, price would be such that demand for organs would clear the market. Now, the, the, the operation of the market would have really some very interesting properties to it. One, 
One of the problems now in the organ market, aside from the fact that a lot of people wait five years or so before they can get an organ, that would be the typical waiting time in the United States for, for kidneys, uh, they wouldn't have to wait any longer. So that would be clearly probably the overwhelming advantage. But there are other subsidiary advantages that are not unimportant, particularly for, for some recipients. Now, if an organ becomes available that more or less meets your type, no matter whether you're in the, the right health conditions or not, you have a great incentive to take that organ because uh, who knows when the next one would come along. With a market, you could arrange to have the transplant done when you're feeling strong and, and, and ready to make sure the match is really close for you because uh, there are a lot of different organs, uh, uh, potential organs that would be on the market. So it makes the process of the timing and the match uh, between donor and recipient in, in terms of organs, much better. And, and that's a, a significant advantage uh, uh, for some recipients who, uh, when they have to get an organ now, are really in poor health, and that uh, therefore raises the risk involved in the transplant and, and lengthens substantially the recovery period. So that would be another I I important aspect to it. It's often said that the market would be dominated by the by the very poor that they would be fooled into giving organs and so on. Uh, I, I think it's not, that's not right for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it, you need to have healthy organs and many of the really poor are, are poor because they're on drugs and other, uh, other problems, they have hepatitis and their organs would not be acceptable. Uh, so it would be, yes, uh, poorer individuals would be more likely to value the money they can get and, and uh, from my point of view, they'd be made better off by doing so, but they would be healthy poor. It's like the voluntary army. I was one of the early advocates of a voluntary army. When it was first suggested, it said it would be dominated by low-income people alike. Well, it hasn't really turned out that way because to get into the army, armed forces, you have to be healthy, high school graduate and the like. And um, so it's lower middle class, I would say, who are the major people in the army. I mean, they, they've turned out to be very effective. I think you find so much, something similar who would be the donors. Now, in terms of people being impulsive and so on, uh, it would be sensible to have a cooling off period. So let's say from the time you agree to give your organ to the time you actually have to sign the final papers and give it, it might be a month or two months. So you have time to think about it. You want to make sure that this is what you really want to do. So the impulsiveness that people uh, uh, often raise as an issue uh, could be greatly moderated by having such a cooling off period, the way we do uh, for other contracts that people sign today. So these would be some of the salient aspects. It also strikes me, you mentioned the concerns about you know, poor, poor donors or poor salespeople in, in this market. So that's looking, that's looking at the poor from the supply side. But what strikes me, I mean, tell me your thought on this. What strikes me is that it's ignoring the demand side, which is that poor people are also more likely and have, and currently under the current setup, have a much worse chance than wealthy in getting an organ now. So that's, a, that's totally, the argument that the poor would be exploited is totally ignoring the fact that what a market for organs might do is help disproportionately poor people. Is that not about right? No question, that's right. Uh, there's a general principle in economics Whenever you put like a price control restriction on the market, it hurts the poor a lot more than the rich. But the rich have other ways around. For example, take the organ market. Um, what are the opportunities available to the rich? Well, they have more influence with doctors and so on. So doctors are more likely to look out for them, even with the greatest and best motives. They're more likely to look out, look out for such people. They can go, you know, uh, tourist. Uh, medicine. They can go to India and other places and get an organ and go to a very good hospitals. India has some extremely good hospitals, do a lot of transplants. And many of the recipients are not from India. They're from uh, you know, well-to-do people who, who come from abroad. Uh, and they can do a lot, a lot of things. They, they can uh, pay under the table people who, who, who claim that they're cousins and so, so on of the recipient, even though they're really just people who are being paid to give the organ. The poor can don't have the resources to do that because the price now in the black market will be substantially greater. So it, it, the, this general principle that when you think you're helping the poor, you really end up hurting the poor with a lot of uh, intervention in the market is certainly applicable in this organ market.